One renowned retirement expert and former Goldman Sachs banker is stepping forward and revealing his number one way to beat inflation. It's a way to receive a nearly 10% yield from the government with virtually no risk. Folks who take the three simple steps he's sharing right now could receive nearly $1,500 from the U.S. Treasury in as little as a few months. Best of all, it's guaranteed by law, and you could pay zero taxes on this low-risk investment. Considering how rapidly inflation continues to soar, you don't want to waste any time missing out on the potential profits he believes are in store for this investment. So to get a copy of the new free report with all the details, simply go to BeatInflation2022.com. Again, that's BeatInflation2022.com for a free copy of his new report. So nice to be uh, in the room with all these beautiful people. What an incredible venue. Uh, so first and foremost, Jamie Dimon, our good friend, Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan, um, came out, uh, I believe, this morning um, saying we should be preparing for a hurricane. He used to say we need to prepare for a storm. He's now saying brace for impact, brace for a hurricane. So interested to get your thoughts on, on generally on the economy right now. And then we'll talk a little bit of mining. But let's start with a general overview. Rick? You know, Daniela, I've, uh, I've correctly forecasted 17 of the last three declines. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm always nervous about my own, uh, my own economic forecast. Uh, unlike Mr. Diamond, I have less to worry about. I'm solvent. <laughs> uh, I, a couple weeks ago, looked at the balance sheet of J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, and saw that the nominal derivatives exposure was over a hundred trillion dollars. And I'm honestly, I realize that I'm drifting from the question. I, I don't understand how you value a business with notional liabilities that exceed a number that I can't write. So certainly I think from Mr. Diamond's point of view where your financial survival is dependent, well, first of all, in the state, but secondly, uh, an economy that's sort of primed for perfection. Hmm. I, I can understand why that hurricane would be of particular concern to him. I, I share the fact that you need to be concerned, but I think part of the reason for the concern is balance sheets that are notionally like his. Mm, well, he, his concern, he was saying, are, are two primary things. Uh, quantitative tightening, which will be happening this month, and the war in Ukraine and its impact on, on commodities. I'm sorry. His main two concerns are quantitative tightening and the, 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 the increase in the price of commodities. You know, Jimmy Dimon um, was very uh, anti-Bitcoin and he kept talking it down. At the same time, his traders were charged for spoofing and manipulating the gold price. Uh, and we found out that, that after he had come up with a stable coin in February of 2019, that was the bottom in Bitcoin prices because all along he was busy trying to come up with his own coin, uh, which he did. And then all of a sudden he loves now Bitcoin. Uh, and, and this idea that Gata always talks about gold being manipulated during that period uh, you have his traders along with other firms and they had the LIBOR trade, but there were many guys that were charged for manipulating gold prices. And they were basically hung out to dry. And then just recently, uh, JP Morgan's firm wrote the check for I think $100 million for them. So his hurricane, maybe, right. maybe he's trying to buy someone or he's trying to manipulate the narrative. <laughs> Miss maybe. <laughs> so uh, I don't think I would bet on, on his so, advice. So you're not trusting Jamie Dimon. That's, no. that's the sound. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about this incredible sector that uh, we're all fortunate to work in. So uh, standing room only for both your talks. They needed to bring in extra chairs. How do you feel about the sentiment right now? I'm feeling good, Rick. Well, do I I'm, have a reason to, or I'm very, am I right? I, I'm very grateful for uh, Manuel having a small room so that I could have standing room only. It was very kind of him to arrange things like that. In, in truth, you know, my, my thesis has always been that bear markets are the cause of bull markets, uh, and bull markets are the cause of bear markets. 
And I don't think that anyone can deny that for a substantial part of the last decade, we had a bear market that was for the record books. Uh, and so I think the, the recovery is one thing, but I think too that the industry had learned some very bad habits in the decade before that. And I think the industry learned good things uh, in this last decade. Uh, so first of all, I think we deserve a bull market. Uh, and I think we're gonna have a bull market, <laughs> which is a wonderful set of circumstances. I believe the gold price at some point in time goes higher. And I think, I mean, I, I mean actually higher. And uh, <laughs> am I done now, Manny? Is that? <laughs> and, and I also think that the market in industrial materials uh, goes higher. If Mr. Diamond is right about a real hurricane, which is to say a recession or a depression, that certainly slows things down. But I think that we will see uh, supply shortages across a lot of industrial materials as a consequence of 30 years of misinvestment and malinvestment. So, uh, uh, by the way, sadly for the crowd, I'm not saying all this happens next week or the week after that, but I do think that even if it isn't uh, imminent, it's inevitable. The bull market. Mm -hmm. But you don't know how far away we are. Uh, you can't suck me in answering no, that anymore. No, six months, Danielle, you used a to, year. You used to get me to do that, yeah. you know. No. Oh. All right. uh, Frank, I know we were speaking um, on the sidelines of the show, and you're, feel, you're feeling good about what you're seeing in the mining sector. Yeah, I, I would say that in the data we collect on the 100 gold producers in the world, 60% of them have free cash flow. You couldn't say that 10 years ago. <laughs> Uh, and I, the crazy acquisition by, I think, Goldfield's valuation for Yamana, yeah. I think it's more political for Goldfield's to try to get assets outside. Uh, they were prohibited from going back 20 years ago from doing it, but I think that's more, uh, it's unusual in this market because you've seen transactions uh, have to be accretive, and if they're not accretive, they get penalized. But I think that boards of directors are much more sensitive uh, on a merger, an acquisition, a financing that's going to be accretive on a per share basis. So that's really bullish for these yeah. markets. But on the other end, you mentioned the incredible cash flows we're seeing. We're seeing more and more companies paying dividends. So isn't it frustrating to see these companies that are so undervalued? Well, it's always frustrating. Uh, yeah, I agree with you, especially when you go the micro cap. But this is, this is a great time to be a buyer. I mean, I, I just saw so many ph phenomenal uh, deals today and companies I met with uh, that this is, this is the time. And I'm really impressed with the, not only the quality of the venue, but the quality of the participants and the questions uh, that I think that we're in for an, a, a wonderful cycle. Uh, the other thing is inflation. If, if you use the CPI number used in 1980 when Paul Volcker came in and took interest rates 6% above the CPI number, the CPI number was around 12%, he took them to 20 to stop inflation. If you use that algorithm today, inflation is 17%. Hmm. So even borrowing today, it's, you're much further ahead because you're basically getting cheap money. Uh, and, and I think we just have to live with that sort of new normal, uh, that how we're going to live with inflation. And, and I also believe in this big macro picture is that the G20 countries have really become, especially the central bankers, they have their own country club. They last a lot longer than presidents or prime ministers last. And they collect, and, they, and this idea of MMT, modern monetary theory, it means that every cycle, and I think it really came out first time seeing that was with Ian McAvity, that each time we go through a cycle, they have to print more and more money. This has become the normal. And so for this century, gold has been positive 80% of the time and has far outperformed the S&P 500, and you don't believe that. So in, according to the mainstream media, so gold as an asset class, I think has a tremendous upside because the general masses don't understand it yet. Exactly, and that's a point I often bring up is that gold is on track to be one of the best performing, if not the best performing asset of the year, but Wall Street doesn't cover this. It's absolutely lapped the S&P. Why does Wall Street not embrace gold, Rick? There hasn't been any fees in gold for 40 years. Uh, my limited experience on Wall Street tells me 
that if they can make money on something, they're fascinated by it. But the truth is, from their point of view, debt is, gold has been a debt asset class relative to fee generation for 40 years. They were fascinated with gold in 78, 79, 80, 81, when there was all kinds of underwritings. You know, there was lots of fee in it. Uh, I, and I, my suspicion, unfounded perhaps, is that uh, Wall Street is substantially more interested in fees uh, than they are the customer. You know, the idea that as an investment bank, you are really interested in companies that have to underwrite and underwrite and underwrite. <laughs> as an investor, I'm interested in companies that don't have to yeah. come to market. So I can understand perfectly Wall Street's fascination, and, or lack of fascination, pardon me, with things that don't generate fees for them. I want to go back to a point that, that Frank brought up, and I feel this is at the core, it has been at the core of your thesis of you like buying things that are on sale. You always say you're not going to buy the $3,000 Burberry coat. You want the $20 Kirkland coat. That would be my right? preference, That's of course. That's a good summation. So something you brought up in your talk, you said that every 10-bagger uh, that's done well for you, you had seen it drop 50%, right? And I think there's a good lesson there. And if you could just talk a little bit about practicing patience <laughs> in the sector. Uh, Daniela always makes me laugh at myself, which is great. <laughs> uh, what I suggested to her uh, and the audience was that uh, most of my really big wins, speculative wins, have taken a very long time. Uh, and I think the average was like five years or six years or something. And, and they've required tenacity because most of the big wins have, uh, on the way from where I bought them to where I sold them, fallen and substantially at some point in time. Now, Daniela, I, I don't want to tell you that everything that I've ever had that fell by 50% subsequently went 10 for one, by the way. Uh, but I do think, in terms of making money in exploration in particular, that generating a 10-bagger or a 20-bagger doesn't mean holding through one piece of good news. You normally need two or three pieces of good news. Good news needs to build on itself. Right. My experience is that that requires three or four or five field seasons. And to the extent that you believe that you have the opportunity to have a 10-bagger, if you don't leave the management time to build that succession of good news, if you don't take advantage of compounding, if your time frame is unrealistic, you're going to deprive yourself of the gain that you're hoping to achieve, I guess is the word that I'm fum words that I'm fumbling to use. Well, I'd like you to share this wisdom. We had this talk um, earlier today of how, how do you know when, when to let go? Like, how do you know when you have a dud on your hands and, okay, well, this isn't going to... This isn't going to come back. Uh, my own technique, if that's the right phrase, is to develop a thesis about what the unanswered question is in any particular exploration target. It might be that there's a nice surface anomaly and they need to trench it to see if it goes to depth. It might be after they've trenched it that they need to drill it. If the thesis is explained to me, and it isn't merely a confusion, a convenient thesis for a stock promoter, but rather if it's a thesis that's supported by ground truth, uh, then I keep holding as long as the information that's coming back supports the thesis. When something goes wrong, when the reason to own a stock goes away, for me the stock has to go away, irrespective of price. If I bought a stock for a buck, because I thought if X, Y, Z would happen, it could go to three, and that would set up a different question which could theoretically take it to six or seven, and that would set up a question which could take it to 10. If the first unanswered question turns out to be no, I sell. Many people buy a stock at a buck and it goes to 70 cents or some number like that, and they say, well, I'm not gonna sell until it goes back to a buck. But why would it go back to a buck? if the reason to own it goes away. So really, I regard speculation as answering a series of unanswered questions. And sadly, if I get a no, I'm a sell. If I get a yes and the stock goes up, I have a conundrum. I have to analyze the new question to determine what that's worth and what the probability of that success is. Frank, how do you, how do you find value? Where do you think the greatest value lies today? The greatest value is probably in the micro caps in many different asset classes. 
this rising interest rate scenario has had a bigger impact in the sell-off of micro-cap to small-cap stocks. It doesn't matter what industry they're, they've been punished more so um, for whatever the fear is. So that's where you get deep value. Um, there's some companies here, uh, like Lucera, uh, traded four times uh, cash flow. Uh, you know, you just, uh, some of the other royalty companies, uh, when you go to the Franco Nevada, they trade at 22 times. Uh, so there's lots of a reset, and I think that that's where the value is going to be. Uh, for my quant approach to picking gold stocks, yeah. um, if for GoAU, which is, uh, it, it's, it's momentum model, so it uses laws of physics. So for momentum, I look at last quarter over four quarters. So the average of the four quarters, if the last quarter is higher than the average of the four quarters, mathematically, the laws of inertia, that, that stock will keep going until all of a sudden that quarter falls below the average of four quarters. Uh, and then you want to look for mean reversion, which is like, think of gravity, the force of gravity. Stocks will fall to a very low multiple. So if you can buy the bottom 20%, 10% on cash flow to enterprise value, they're the ones that get taken out, or they're the ones that go through this incredible mean reversion that takes place. So it's the idea of being a quantum mentalist. You do the fundamental work where you do as a fundamental analyst, but then you apply the quant tools. Uh, and that's sort of the simple way of looking at gold stocks. When it comes to the juniors, you're looking for factors of reserves per share, uh, and you're gonna look for the cash flow, uh, per share and the revenue per share. And then after that, the sweet stuff is you have to apply the Black Shoals concept of thinking, the optionality. What is the optionality of that deposit? Uh, and what is the, de or ge geologists will say, look at the royalty company bought something and get back their money in 10 years and they're gonna make 4% of their money, they're gonna get it all back in 10 years. However, the geologist comes in and says, that's a 30-year mine life. The rest is free. So what is that optionality worth? Or remember Ross Beatty when he bought up all the copper assets and he was buying copper and copper was at 80 cents. He was buying deposits that everyone laughed at him that would only become commercially viable at $2. But he was basically paying one penny a pound of copper. So he played and the ultimatum made a billion dollars on that run of of mm -hmm. Black Shoals being applied. So there are some of the companies here that have tremendous optionality uh, on their balance sheets. And as a quant, if you can turn around and look at that, uh, buy them, buy them on the down days, and because when it takes off, it'll be so fast. Frank, I have to ask you, you're wearing your Bitcoin, Bitcoin shirt and a mining, I mean. I'm now a mining promoter. I mean. <laughs> No, but my point is you're, you're one of the, the hybrids, I call successful hybrids, that have managed to embrace uh, two sectors that often don't get along, right? I want to just get your thoughts uh, on you know, the, the downturn that we've seen in, in the cryptocurrency space. Is it a, a crypto, full-on crypto winter? What season are we in? The crypto winters, the summers, whatever, are so much sentiment-driven. It's very sentiment driven between the debate of the centralists, which is the regulatory, and the decentralists. What you're seeing is the adoption. Uh, you get the president of the EU with her, her Hermes bag, her uh, Gucci shoes, and all these luxury items, and, and she's coming out to make these comments that are just like they're off base of what is going on in the world. And Gucci announces they're going to take Bitcoin and Ethereum to buy your, your Gucci shoes. So you have this incredible adoption taking place around the world by businesses. But however, you've got the centralists over here saying, no, it's bad and evil. And I just think that sentiment swing back and forth creates an opportunity that's just more volatile. Uh, and some companies like Hive traded two and a half times cash flow. And that's all sentiment has nothing to do with fundamentals. How do you keep your cool? I mean, those weeks were stressful. So when you see those prices, what's going on in your head? As long as, as long as I grow that revenue per share and that cash flow per share, and I build nine Bitcoin a day on my balance sheet, right. that, that when it turns, it will go exponentially. 
and I've seen it, I've seen it go up exponentially, I've seen it follow the square root, and then I've seen it go back up exponentially. And, and in 2018, a lot of it was sentiment by government regulatory, that came off, and now it started up again. I just believe it's just part of the, the evolution of a, a new industry being accepted around the world. So there's room for both for you? Well, the, because actually, when you go and meet Bitcoin people, A, they're mostly younger, but B, and more important, they read the same Old Testament that gold bugs read, that government does not respect private property, that government will destroy currency, fiat, and that the whole concept of Bitcoin was a hedge against that. So they actually read from the same book. And then you get guys like Peter Schiff that want a lot of publicity and he wants to take on a crypto industry to try to get some publicity. And he's just so off base because the reasons for owning both are very similar. And, and I think that yeah. it's just, just what it is. So we, I'm turning around and I like both. Uh, I like, and I'm a big believer of 10% golden rule and have it in gold and high quality gold stocks, rebalance once a year for a diversified portfolio. It's been a home run. Bitcoin, Ethereum, 2 to 3%. I'll go back to mining, but just curious, why do you stay away from the crypto space? I, uh, early in my career, thought that a success in business was transferable to other parts of business. And I learned for me that wasn't the case. Uh, I have to understand something very thoroughly. And I have to believe that I have uh, intellectual capital that allows me to outcompete my competitors in a space. And I don't have that in crypto. I, yeah. I invest successfully in conventional financial services, not fintech, but conventional financial services. And I invest successfully in natural resources. And between those two sectors, there's more opportunity than I have money. Uh, and the idea that I would get out of my specialty into somebody else's specialty where they could outcompete me, I'm, I'm perfectly capable of mis making mistakes in things that I know very well. And I don't feel any particular need to make mistakes outside of my area of expertise. So not even as a speculation, not interested. You want to know. Not interested at all. Uh, You're also not a gamer. No. You're not a no. gamer. I, Frank, Frank, Frank I, are you a gamer? Frank, I can, no. I, I can barely operate my phone. Never mind the game. Yeah. Um, Frank mentioned Goldfields Yamana, and I want to get your thoughts on M&A in the space. Are we going to see uh, record M&A more than ever? I hope so. Yeah. I don't think we're going to see it for a while because the excesses of the last period of M&A were so extraordinary uh, that billions of dollars were lost, and mercifully, many executives were allowed to pursue other employment opportunities. So the industry will be chastened. But the industry needs more than anything else scale, which lowers the cost of capital. And in particular, the industry needs less general and administrative expense relative to assets under management and EBIT. So intelligently constructed M&A, which is to say amalgamation, which strips out management expense uh, and increases management's ability to allocate cash rationally is a very good thing. Not the type of M&A that we saw in the last decade. Uh, you know, got a hunch, bet a bunch, uh, that kind of thing. But rather intelligently constructed M&A, or at least rational M&A, I think is a very good thing. You know, one of the things I, I saw in my journey of learning about Bitcoin and Ethereum and the sort of young libertarians um, is, is the amount of the number and it's only that, that shocks you that make money gaming. It's now an NCAA sport in America. So there's a huge transfer of wealth from baby boomers to millennials and generations X, Y, and Z that are gamers. And if you're really good at a game, you get rewarded in digital money. And that digital money allows you to be competitive around the world scene. And I met a guy that started a, a company, mobile gaming company, and he only did six billion in revenue. Because he was able to use the digital world, and, and, and he has 
<laughs> he processes 500 million instructions per second in 32 languages and uses AI so the kid in Taipei can talk fluently with the kid in uh, 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 Germany and they don't know they're, they're two different countries but they're gaming and competing with each other and he does six billion in revenue. So that world, around the world, and I know from mining Ethereum, that there's 30 million kids mining Ethereum when they go to bed and they run up the electrical bill of their parents. <laughs> and, and I used to have a paper route, but these kids make an extra thousand to four thousand dollars a year mining Ethereum, which they go out and they spend and they convert it to cash. So we have a transformation of $10 trillion leaving baby boomers over to this other right. entity, this other demographic that embraced digital money. And the onboarding, the ability to all of a sudden go and open an account and trade these new tokens or these new coins has been so easy that it's attracted billions and billions of dollars of speculative money in addition to coders creating new tokens yeah. that you cannot do in the stock market. And the best example I explained this morning on the big transfer was PayPal. You can't buy my ETFs like Jets on PayPal or any of the stocks that are here. But you can buy Bitcoin and you don't have to go to the bank and you can trade it out and then go buy a TV at Best Buy, it, and that's all seamless, one account. So you have a huge audience of millions of young people that are using systems like PayPal, and PayPal is not going to go and compete with Robinhood, uh, and that's a new world. Yeah. But the best part for everyone in this room is that that ecosystem, they like to call it, that ecosystem believe in sound money in private property rights because they believe in intellectual property rights because this is my algorithm. This is my idea and I wanted a patent and I'm going to get rich from it. So the Bitcoin kids are out there, are out to get rich. The gold bugs are out to protect their wealth. And there's a very small group in there that speculate in gold stocks to get rich. But that audience of young investors, it's very difficult to have speculative money and trade stocks when I can trade Bitcoin 24-7. I can trade the volatility all over the world. And that there's more uh, millennials in generation X, Y, and Z than there are baby boomers. So we're going through this big demographic shift, and that's what I find interesting. Yeah, and, and it will completely, I mean, not to go too off script here, but it will completely disrupt the workforce because these kids don't want nine to five. They don't want office jobs, right? No. Like, can you imagine the future? They don't want, you know, they don't want a boss, right? Absolutely. I'll give you a classic that really shocked me. I have a, the first airlines ETF that's out there, and it goes up to $140 million, and along comes, and I spent five years building the brand. Along comes COVID, and one month it's $40 million. And it's trading 40,000 shares a day. Everything's locked down. In the, from March of 2020, Till April of 2020, my daily volume goes from 40,000 to 400,000. The ETF of airlines has fallen 70%. What is happening? Then by May, it's 800,000 shares a day are trading. Every analyst on Wall Street is negative on airlines, but every analyst on YouTube is bullish. And all these kids that have their Series 7, 63, whatever the Canadian yeah. Securities course, they're stuck at home. And I find out they know every best airplane. They don't buy real assets. They go for holidays. They know where to go. They want that experiencing economy. But so they're now stuck at home and they start buying jets because the airlines fell every time there's a global crisis, 70%, and a year later, they're up 80 to 120%. Not one analyst on Wall Street could give me that rational reason, but all the YouTubers did. And I meet young people that have two million followers. 
So Jets bottoms when Buffett gets out. Buffett says he's out. Well, Buffett's 90 years old. He's worried about COVID. Jets goes from 11 to $28. So who's right? It's all these kids. But so what, how can the mining industry learn from that? How can they apply that to try and attract that crowd? Is there anything they could do? So that's what I did with Hive was all of a sudden recognize that this is the new audience and you communicate. And Rick himself, Rick, how many Zoom interviews did you start doing? Yeah. Right? More, more than Daniela. So you got, <laughs> I don't know about that, but. <laughs> so you got to get... But just think of Daniela, right. her, her brand and the impact was through Kitco that basically gave this global presence from these YouTubers. And then all of a sudden you go to Stansbury, which had no followers. And what were the numbers? What happened there? Where did they go from? Half a million. Right from half a million. where? 60,000? Zero. Yeah, basically. In so it yeah. basically goes year. exponentially. And, and so there's a thirst and hunger by the YouTubers around the world. And the other one was Peloton Bike. So they're on their Peloton listening to podcasts. So who's doing podcasts? Rick and Frank. Yeah. yeah right? It's, oh, I listened to a guy in an interview who called me up and said, well, I just heard the podcast, listened to Rick, and this is what he thinks. And, uh, and, and so it's a new world. That's what I'm trying to share with you. It's a new world. And, and, and try to, how do you embrace it? And the analysts on Wall Street have a lot of them lost their jobs over first Mythic 2 came along, and then comes COVID. Uh, and there's still a hunger for information and people want to make money. Everyone wants to make money. Um, I'm going to wrap now, I thought, with uh, so everyone can get to their dinner. This is incredible. And combo, how many here watch Daniela's <laughs> YouTube? How many? Yay. There you Thank go. you. And if you're not, shame on you. <laughs> I'm going to take Frank everywhere with me. Just. No, because you know. she does incredible interviews with a broad spectrum of people that have depth and breadth in their category, their industry. Well, and you're you. not going to get that from Wall Street because the compliance departments rewrite all the research. Everything gets scrubbed down. And so if you want to get, you know, get where there's interesting dialogue, you have to listen to people like Daniela in her interviews. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate that. I that is not a paid endorsement, so th <laughs> thank you. Um, I want to wrap with words of wisdom because the common denominator amongst both these gentlemen is that they don't need to be here. They came because they love the sector and they love to educate people. Frank, just you, just, you have a department named the Frank Holmes, what is it, at Huron University? Like a whole wing named it's after you now because you're giving back. And you, that's how much you believe in education, Rick. I know how much you believe in education. Um, so I guess just, you know, you say it, Rick, set yourself up to benefit from wisdom. So just, you know, for all the fine folks out here, perils of wisdom, what should they walk away with? Well, I think in terms of natural resource investing, the first piece of wisdom, been a slogan of mine for years, uh, you're either going to be a contrarian or you're going to be a victim. Uh, bear markets are your friends, they're sales. Uh, I think the other thing, that many people in the room might fail at is time. People have time preference and they think their time preference matters. Uh, but the stock doesn't care what's convenient to you. The stock doesn't care if you don't like volatility. So I would suggest investing with very good people, investing when stuff is out of favor. When you start feeling smart, start selling. Uh, that's always a bad sign. Uh, and, and you know, do the work. Too often at conferences, the advice from the podium seems to be got a hunch or I got a hunch, you bet a bunch. Um, that doesn't have a happy ending. You know, really Do the work. A happy ending. I mean, people here are doing the right thing. They're coming, talking to companies. Yeah. They're where the rubber meets the road. By the way, Daniela, we didn't come here primarily out of a, a love of education, although that was a motivator. <laughs> we came because you asked us. So. <laughs> And I thank you. And I was going to share that story. But so I, I have two sort of thoughts to share with everyone. One, everyone in the room knows Sir John Templeton. And Sir John uh, always started his meeting with a prayer. And it was always to divine providence, the energy of life, 
and it was the beginning of every shareholder meeting was a prayer. And what he's trying to instruct everyone is, that, is to remember that you should pray before you buy the stock, not after. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, please help it to go up. So that's the first sort of sage advice I've learned over the years. And uh, two, it, it's, is to be grateful. We're all here. And we all have challenges. It doesn't matter it's family, it's governments, doesn't matter, business. But we're here, and it's beautiful. The venue is beautiful. It's fascinating to see old friends and meet new people. We're blessed. And the research at MIT went out, and they found that when people spend more time being grateful, uh, that better things happen to them, especially health and uh, wealth, their ability. So we should all be just grateful and grateful that you're my friend for, and, and Rick, we've known each other for such a long time. And uh, so gratitude is the key element I share with that everyone. That is beautiful. And I am, thank you. And um, if I could share the story, and by the way, I am grateful uh, for Frank and for Rick. Um, for all the wisdom, and when Manuel asked me, he called me up and said, can you put together a dream panel? You know, who would it be at this show? And I said, well, you gotta have Frank Holmes, and you gotta have Rick Rule. He said, do you think they'll do it? And I said, I don't know, I'm gonna, I'll call and I'll ask, and that's exactly what happened. And without uh, missing a beat, they said, absolutely, we'll be there. And uh, they didn't have to be, <laughs> they didn't have to come, they didn't have to take the time, you guys don't need the visibility. Um, and I just want to say how much I appreciate that. So thank you so much, Rick and thank Frank. You. And thank you all for being here. So thank you. And, and did everyone look up and see? Did everyone look up? Look up. Yeah, that's how high goal is going. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. Enjoy the evening. Oops. I need the stairs.